Most of week 8 is in the books, and it started back on Thursday night between the Ravens and Bucks. Baltimore had a very slow start as they had just three points in the first half, then made some offensive adjustments to cope with tight end Mark Andrews being out, and eventually won 27-22. One of the biggest takeaways I had from this game was the Ravens' play calling, specifically in the first half, was atrocious. They threw the ball an enormous amount, and this isn't a Lamar can't throw and he's a running back take, because that's simply not true. As much as it is to say, and to quote Richard Sherman, run the dang ball. They threw the ball only eight times in the second half and scored 24 points on four drives. The team finished with 33 carries for over 230 yards and a touchdown, and of course, the W. Run the ball, Baltimore. And as for Tampa, there's a lot of problems. Tom Brady wasn't good on Thursday night relative to how he's played for a lot of the season, but Thursday night was his low point. Now, that could have had something to do with what was announced Friday in his personal life, but Tom was not the only problem with Tampa on Thursday. Devin White has been a major problem for Tampa and has been not okay, not below average, but bad all season. And to give you an idea of how bad he has been, he has a run defense grade on PFF of 29.4, which is terrible, there's no way around that. And when quarterbacks are targeting him, they have a passer rating of 113.3, which would rank first in the NFL at the moment. The Bucks are not in a good place, and the interior offensive line is not good, and the Bucks have a lot of problems. Next up is Broncos-Jags, and this game was a Sunday morning game across the pond. The Broncos were clowned all week for Russell Wilson doing high knees on the plane, and I thought they were going to drop this game in the Jags' second home. Ultimately, they did not, and their season, by the absolute skin of their teeth, is still alive. It is very much a survive and advance basis for the Broncos at this point, and their wins are against the Texans, the 49ers, and Jimmy's first game starting this year, and now the Jags. I'm not bought in on them by any stretch of the imagination, and am eager to see how they play against Tennessee coming off of their bye. As for Jacksonville, Travis Etienne is very much the answer at running back for the next few years. I have some questions around Trevor Lawrence right now, but the weapons he has around him for the most part are not all that good. And I do think the Jags need to make anything happen in terms of getting weapons around him this offseason. Whether that's trade a first round pick, not necessarily their top two or three overall pick, but trade a high pick for a receiver like the Eagles did with AJ Brown, whatever the case may be, they need to continue to help Trevor out. Raiders Saints in the Big Easy, and there's not a lot of positive things to say about the Raiders right now. They went all in this offseason and are 2-5 and five through 7 games, with their only wins over Denver and Houston. Devontae Adams had one catch on Sunday for 3 yards, even with Darren Waller out. I said after they started 0-2 in the vaunted AFC they were done, but I was told it would take time for this team to gel. Head coach Josh McDaniels is not an NFL caliber head coach. Derek Carr has, for lack of better wording, shit the bed all year, and they are not in an ideal situation moving forward. This was against a Saints team with a backup quarterback, two of their top three receivers out, and top corner out. And you get shut out. Somebody needs fired, and this was awful. As for New Orleans, they beat a bad Raiders team, and I'm not saying to not have any enjoyment from this, because there is a lot of positive things to take away, but for me personally, to think this team can win a playoff game, not just win the NFC South, I want to see it happen more often as a week ago they were beat on the road by Arizona. From the Big Easy, we go to the Big Apple to discuss Patriots Jets, and I want to talk about Zach Wilson. Jets fans, I've been very supportive of everything you guys have done this year, but I fear the quarterback position in the long run as long as Zach Wilson is under center. This is a good team, but Wilson threw three interceptions today, completed less than 50% of his passes, and his team put up 17 points. He threw an interception trying to throw the ball out of bounds, and the other two were off his back foot. He has to play better, period. As for New England, Mac Jones certainly wasn't a world beater on Sunday, and it showed. He did enough to help the Patriots get the win, but for both the Patriots and Jets, neither team at the moment has a long-term franchise quarterback. 
Also, Ramondre Stevenson is an animal. Heading west on I-80 for a few hundred miles and then north on I-75 as well, we go to Detroit to discuss the Dolphins and Lions. This is a very tough loss for Detroit, and stop me if you've heard that before, but it's hard to find something positive to spin for Detroit. They're going to have a high draft pick, and hopefully they select a quarterback, but aside from that, there's not much to say. They blew a 14-point lead, couldn't stop Tyreek Hill or Jalen Waddell, and gave up nearly 400 passing yards at home. I want Dan Campbell to succeed in the worst way and lead them to success, but this is concerning. As for Miami, a win is a win at this point in the year, and not to be so bland, but this is what they were supposed to do. They are 5-0 in games when Tua has started, and here's the keyword, finished. The Dolphins' offense is explosive, extremely fun to watch, and I think they can go as far as their defense allows. Bears-Cowboys is up, and on paper, yes, the Bears lost by 20 points, but by no means is this the end of the world. In fact, the biggest positive takeaway Chicago can have from this loss is Justin Fields looked like the best quarterback from the 2021 draft class on Sunday, and it wasn't close either. The defense was awful, and I'm not trying to hide that from Chicago, but in a season you knew that going in was going to be a rebuilding year, the Bears at the moment have an exciting young quarterback they believe they can build around, and it's been a long time for Chicago since they've had that. As for Dallas, we've been creeping towards this, and I hope this officially gets us there, but feed Tony Pollard. Enough messing around with splitting carries and just make him the guy. Dak is also back, and Michael Parsons, guys, I'm being as honest as I possibly can here. I think the torch was passed from J.J. Watt to Aaron Donald in 2016, and I think Aaron passed the torch to Micah this year. He is special, and I generally stay away from this word, but Micah truly is a once-in-a-generation player. Heading north on Interstate 35 for about a thousand miles, we go to the Twin Cities to discuss the Cardinals and Vikings. The Cardinals offense seemingly either gets a quick pass and they move the sticks, or, and this is an exaggeration, Kyler runs around like it's a game of Madden and either makes an insane play or it's an incomplete pass with seldom in between. I don't think this team is good enough to go anywhere, but I feel like they are generally underwhelming. The special teams for them was awful. Positive takeaway for the Cardinals? DeAndre Hopkins is very much one of the best receivers in the league. The touchdown he had over Harrison Smith was insane. He's a dog. As for Minnesota, this felt like a complete game offensively for the first time and a true team win. The pass rush was unreal and Zedarius Smith had his best game as a Viking. The defense certainly isn't the 85 Bears, but they hold the fort down when it matters and they stepped up and helped the Vikings improve to 6-1. Panthers-Falcons is up, and this was unintentionally the best game of the day. I do think it was better for the Panthers in the long run to end up losing this game, but I was very glad to see this team both care and play with everything they have down to the wire. DJ Moore finally had his big game of the year, and I really hope this is a sign of things to come. I do expect them to lose a lot moving forward, but they could easily pack it in, and they're not. As for Atlanta, an ugly win, but a win nonetheless. Kyle Pitts finally was targeted and produced, which is a concept I know that is shocking. This was also, in a lot of ways, a very Falcons game. Atlanta is on top of the NFC South, and I don't mean this to sound as mean as it does, but I don't think Atlanta is going to go very far, nor do I think this will hold, especially if they are consistently in games like this. I'm happy for Atlanta, but I'm not ready to have any wild takes regarding them for the rest of the season. The keystone clash between the Steelers and Eagles is up, and this went about as well as expected. The Steelers are a rebuilding team and have a rookie quarterback and went on the road to a team that's 6-0 and lost, and the Eagles were also coming off of the bye. Within this, I do think offensive coordinator Matt Canada should be fired. Chase Claypool, yes, Chase Claypool, threw their only touchdown. This was a disaster, and unfortunately, this will be Mike Tomlin's first season with a losing record. 
As for Philly, AJ Brown has been worth every penny and then some so far. He was the true number one receiver they needed and has paid dividends beyond measure. He had three first half touchdowns on Sunday and the Eagles were a much better team and it showed. They've been my favorite to win the NFC since week two, this dismantling of the Minnesota Vikings and nothing changed in week eight. They came off the bye still dominant and there's no reason to think they can't be 8-0 with the win in Houston on Thursday. And speaking of Houston, the Texans-Titans game is up, and despite the score being a 17-10 win for Tennessee, the Titans dominated this game in the trenches, and King Henry had another 200-yard rushing game. The Titans had over 300 yards rushing on the day, and for everyone that thinks they should bench Tannehill, I think we need to pump the brakes on that. Malik Willis is a project quarterback, and it definitely showed on Sunday. Could he become a starter at some point? Maybe, but for now he is a project and it is Ryan's team. And for Houston, this team is not on the same level as a lot of other NFL teams. I realize I've said this a lot recently and I do apologize for this, but it's true. I don't want to completely degrade the Texans and read a bunch of stats on a team that everyone knows is rebuilding. They're going to select in the top five next year and it is mock draft season. Commanders Colts, and what an ending to the game between Heineke and Ellinger. For Washington, I know what you gave up for Carson, but roll with Heineke for the rest of the season. He's exciting, the guys love him, and he makes plays. Terry McLaurin has been underutilized for a while now, but he had an insanely clutch play at the end of the game, which helped Washington secure the win. As for Indy, this team routinely gets beat time and time again in the trenches, and that's an extremely frustrating way to lose. And when they don't, and the quarterback makes a great throw, there's a play at the end like when Michael Pittman drops a ball. It's been a very frustrating season for the 2022 Colts. I did a video on Indy last week and thoroughly discussed everything between the offensive line, the Matt Ryan trade, and everything. I recommend checking it out. This is a team that has all the smells of firing the coach and GM at the end of the year, making a drastic change at the quarterback position, and move on to 2023. Giants Seahawks time and I think some people would legitimately question the Giants after this game and kind of ask if their run is over. I don't think that and in fact I think it's far from it. Yes, they lost. It is what it is. They have as many losses as the Kansas City Chiefs at the moment, but they turn the ball over twice, their receivers aren't good, and they had to play from behind. This team isn't built to play from behind down 14 on the road, but in typical Brian Dable fashion, they never gave up. They also have the Texans and Lions off their bye, so I think they will be 8-2. As for Seattle, the offense wasn't bad on Sunday, but it was far from great. The defense stepped up and they play fast, physical, and pissed off. They are a very fun team to watch and I can't wait to see how their season plays out. And from Seattle, we go to another NFC West clash between the Rams and Niners. The Rams, to me, through eight weeks are, in a lot of ways, done. To be fair, and I will acknowledge this, I said the same thing last year, but they made a trade for Odell Beckham and Von Miller, and the rest is history. But they can't run the ball, and I mean they truly cannot run the ball. And heading into this game, all they heard was the 49ers own them, and guess what? They lost by three scores on their home turf to the 49ers. I will say about the Rams, the Allen Robinson taunting penalty was embarrassing for the NFL, but that did not decide the game. As for San Francisco, I think they are going to the NFC Championship game and will be playing in Philly for a trip to the Super Bowl. They are that good, and we got a glimpse of what they can be with Christian McCaffrey at full effect today. And to me, that's a deep postseason contender. The Packers are also done in a lot of ways, and the Bills are, to me, through eight weeks, the future Super Bowl champions. And that's all I have for today's video. I hope you enjoyed. If you did, please like the video and subscribe to the channel as it would truly mean the world. And until next time, as always, please be safe and have a great day. Love you guys.